Welcome to today's Postgres conference webinar functions, use and misuse. We're joined by Henrietta Dombrovskaya, Director of Analytics at BrokerX, who will discuss how functions are executed and how using functions affects performance, how to use functions with user-defined types, the advantage and disadvantages of using functions in OPT and OLAP environments, and how to use functions with dynamic SQL. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. A little bit about your speaker. So Hetty is a database researcher and developer with over 35 years of academic and industrial experience. She holds a PhD in computer science from the University of St. Petersburg in Russia. And at present, she's the director of data analytics at BrokerX, a local organizer of the Chicago Postgres QL user group an active community member and a frequent speaker at Postgres conferences, an author of Postgres QL query optimization book and many, many other titles. Um, so welcome to you, Hetty. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off, take it away. Okay. All right, thank you, Linda. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for attending my presentation. As Linda just uh, noted, Everything is recorded, so I really appreciate people taking time and attending in person because everybody needs audience, you know, even silent audience is still better than that. Uh, so today's uh, topic is functions and procedures, use and misuse. And indeed, uh, functions and storage procedures are in some sense, I think, most controversial objects in PostgreSQL because uh, they're like, I think, at least 50% of the time, they are used like in the wrong place and not used in the right place. So uh, as it was mentioned, uh, the examples which I will use um, coming uh, from the book, uh, Postgres um, Query Optimization. So just 10 seconds of self-promotion, book is still there available in Amazon, in uh, paperback and in electronic. And uh, all the examples are available on the open source uh, Postgres Air database. So uh, you should have this link and like, if you care, you can just, uh, you know, uh, get this uh, QR code from your screens. Uh, so this is like full size database. You can uh, download it and use for all sorts of different things. Uh, you can test um, pretty much everything on this database. Uh, so uh, again, uh, the uh, the examples will be based on the tables of uh, from this database, and I will like mention briefly what they are. But hopefully, most examples will be like self-explanatory. So we will start with functions. Uh, and uh, how are using it? So by functions. Like, as I said, functions are most underused and misused objects in PostgreSQL, from my perspective. So why? Because everybody started from some programming language and everybody knows how to write functions in programming language. So does it help to write Postgres functions? Everybody think it does? Actually, it does not. No, it does not help to write Postgres functions. Uh, let's take a closer look at why and how Postgres functions are different from functions in programming languages. So first of all, there are two types of functions. First are internal functions, which are actually pretty much like your functions in C or Java, whatever you want. You can use like um, mathematical functions, string functions, time functions. So those are kind of something which are really familiar. And then there are user-defined functions, which can be written in query languages, like functions written in uh, SQL. There can be C functions, or like on C or C-like languages. And there are other functions, which can be written on procedural languages. Uh, for example, like uh, for, uh, on PL SQL, you can do Python functions and many other functions. So in today's presentation, will be talking solely about functions which are written in Postgres programming uh, procedural languages, PLPG as well. Uh, so uh, all the functions which are written in PLPG as well can include 
any SQL operator, any control structures, if case uh, loops, etc., and it can include calls to other functions. So for start, let's look at one uh, example of how to create function. To create function, we use create function operator. So what we have here, that is the name of the function. So the name of the function is text in numeric. Then it has parameter. Uh, the parameter is called input text and it's of type text. Then we're saying it returns integer and it is written on PLPG SQL language. And all the rest is the function body. So it starts from body, ends from body. Right? Uh, and uh, that is like a very simple thing, which is uh, basically converting text to integer. Uh, and the first question you might ask, why we need to create a separate function uh, for this simple operation? Doesn't Postgres have ways to convert text to numeric? Absolutely. And actually several ways to convert a uh, text to numeric. Uh, so you can do cast, you can do like convert to numeric, uh, you can convert to number, like all sorts of things. But what happens if the text uh, that you pass is not something which is convertible to number? So if it's not like one or 100 or whatever, what it's like A1. So what will happen? All of this system uh, supplied conversion function will error. It will generate Postgres error. And then the whole SQL where you are applying this function will collapse and you do not want it. So you want to do something in exception. So what to do when the uh, parameter which is passed is not, uh, does not represent uh, integer, does not represent any numeric. So in this function, we said, okay, do nothing, right? Return now. So this allows us to operate on some strings and if it converts to integer grade, if nothing return now. Uh, actually, uh, that might be not always a good idea to use this type of function, but at least that's the purpose. And we will see in a little bit why it might not be always a good idea. So uh, now really quickly, because that is everything you can see in the documentation. So I will go through next couple of slides really quickly. So function might have named parameters or position parameters. So we can define it by name as here we have input text or we can just have parameter one, parameter two, et cetera. Uh, parameters might be specified as in, out or in, out, although most of the time we use in parameters without out and then we just read return function uh, result of the function like what it returns also function uh, there is such a thing as function overload which means you can define the function with the same name and with different types of uh, different sets of parameters different number of parameters different part of parameters so uh, you may call the same function. Like here, again, we are using Postgres Air database and the function num passengers calculates the number of passengers. It can be on the flight ID. So uh, we can pass flight ID, return number of passengers on the flight. We can uh, also return number of passengers uh, which de uh, who departed from this specific airport on the specific date, or we can, uh, do it by the uh, flight uh, flight number, which is text field. Uh, so uh, every everything uh, here will be uh, actually fine, uh, except of uh, we cannot change the return type. So when we try to change return type, so we had integer, 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 and then we said, oops, numeric, and this will return an error because all the functions uh, which we use for overload uh, if we have the same name, parameters might be different, but it should return the same type. Uh, so that's like all the exception. Uh, another thing which is worth mentioning, it's nested dollar quoting, uh, because that's absolutely wonderful Postgres feature, as quite often you need to have string within string. Like example here, you want to pass a error message and you need to uh, have the text error, uh, we, we, you need to have 
quote inside, for example, here, record can be updated. So you need pen with quote. So if you do not have special uh, notation for uh, handling this, you always need to double this quote, like then triple this quote and whatever. So Postgres allows nested dollar quoting. So every double uh, dollar sign means, might mean the beginning of the string and then the matching double dollar sign means the end of the string. And also you can put any identifier in between. So if you look at the function body, function body is also a text. So it's passed to the create function as a text. So you have here uh, dollar, uh, dollar function dollar, that's like the end of the text of the function and the beginning was also function. And inside you can have multiple other dollar quarters and they all will be nested properly. So you can have string within string within string. It's actually extremely helpful, one of the best uh, features for this. Um, so this being said, uh, what we just mentioned, so the body of the function is passed when function is created as the string. Uh, which means it can be pretty much anything. And uh, all the very, very basic syntax checks are performed when function is created. So uh, this being said, uh, when you uh, create function, like say you did it in Oracle, for example, or like in Sybase, uh, you most of the time assume, okay, create function, function created successfully, that means function works. So with Postgres, it means virtually nothing. So the only thing that means that you have the right uh, matching number of if, then, and if, or like case, and case. So all the very basic checks. There might be lots of errors which are not identified uh, when function is created. Again, that is an example from Postgres Air database. So we create this uh, function number of passengers uh, departed from this airport on this departure date. We run create it created successfully, right? Now we want to execute it. So now we're trying to execute it and uh, so create, return successfully, great. Uh, we do execute, select number of passengers departed from Mahara on July 7. What we are getting, we're getting an error message. Column airport code does not exist. So what? Yeah, because actually <laughs> we said airport code in the function, but actually the correct column name was departure airport. So Postgres did not even check whether we reference correct columns for this table. Then, okay, fix this. Okay, it's not airport code, it's departure airport, run again. Column P day does not exist. Yes, because the parameter was called not P day, but it was called P departure date. And again, when function was created, Postgres did not check, should have, no, it doesn't. Because again, we pass it as a, body of the function was a string and uh, these details were not checked, okay? So uh, in contrast to other databases, if you have experience of creating functions as well, uh, anywhere else, functions in Postgres are stored in form of the source code. No, they're not really compiled. Function is created, it does not mean it is compiled. It is stored as a source code. Functions are interpreted during execution. In, even when function is executed, only when the execution path reaches this specific command, this command will be analyzed and prepared statement will be created. Uh, and it will be prepared statement will be reused in the same session. So if you run the same function multiple times in the same session, but otherwise it won't be, it will start all over again. So that means that you might not discover some errors in your function uh, for a while. <laughs> So that means that when you test the functions, you need to pay special attention. You tested all the cases because if you have multiple case statements, for example, and one of the case statements was never reached, you might never even know your function has an error. So that's kind of warning for the functions. Uh, also, when you create, uh, again, that's we're talking today about uh, PLP GSQL functions. No execution plan is created. So no checks of existence of tables, columns, or other functions are performed, uh, whatever is referenced in the function body. And you might even know whether it works or not. So uh, just be very careful while using functions. It's not what you expect uh, from the programming language experience. Uh, other thing, both these functions are atomic. 
So that means that you cannot initiate, uh, begin a commit or rollback transaction inside the function. And again, for people who are coming from other databases, it's huge disappointment. So we will talk a little bit at the end of this session, it is uh, done with uh, Postgres story passages. But uh, functions are atomic. And also you can never explain function if you are used to um, running explain uh, to see how your SQL will work, you cannot explain the function. Like the only thing it will give you, okay, explain, uh, it will say, okay, that is like the result. So if you want to know what path, execution path is chosen, you need to actually run explain plan for specific statements inside the function with specific parameters. So that is important. Uh, and again, the reason originally for this atomicity, because original purpose of the function was uh, to be able to select them uh, in the select list. So for example, you can do this, uh, call this functions uh, when you select something from this as passengers, right? So here you have a select text to integer as passport number, select text to date, expiration date uh, from the uh, passenger passport uh, table. Uh, so that is how we can use functions. And now I want to tell you why it's not, not always a good idea. Uh, precisely because of this, that functions are atomic. Uh, and it might be not so pronounced uh, when you use functions uh, in the OTP environment, when you select at any given moment all the small number of um, rows, uh, but it might be more pronounced uh, when you do it uh, for the large data volume. So here we have uh, this function. Again, uh, create function number of passengers on specific flight. Awesome, right? So we uh, select count uh, from the passengers who were registered for specific flight. Great. Uh, now, we do want to use this function in select. And so what we're doing, uh, we are doing, uh, so for each flight which departed from Ahara uh, on uh, July 5th, uh, between July 5th and uh, July 13th, uh, we are selecting flight ID and the number of passengers. Uh, so legit, okay, that's what we want. We want to reuse the function. So the execution time for this statement will be three and a half seconds. You might say it's not the end of the world, but honestly, that is something alarming for online application. Three and a half seconds, just selecting uh, the like number of passengers. So if you, instead of calling function, you will perform this calculation inside select. So you'll do select flight, count as number of passengers, and you will do this grouping inside select. The execution time is actually less than a second. So by this difference, the difference is precisely because function is atomic and optimization of the function is not included in the optimization of the whole SQL. So in this case, function will be executed each time it is called separately. So that is a so-called optimization fence. And uh, that is something we just um, you know, uh, need to have in mind. So not always using functions, especially in longer queries, is a good idea. Now, uh, you might ask, uh, okay, so that is custom function. What about simple transformation? This, uh, you know, I always knew it's problematic and for Postgres Air, we built this table, uh, passenger passport, specifically to show why it might be a problem on the large data volumes. So this, uh, table was created uh, as a uh, know-how in many systems when people do not know where to put new data they use something like custom types like custom defined types special types and they put everything in this big table with like type and qualify etc so that was uh, how we build this passenger passport table so there are lots lots of different information in kind of key value format um, uh, that huge table, I think it's like 15 million rows, something massive. Uh, so you just do select passenger ID, passport number, passenger expiration date from passenger passport. Okay. Uh, so 16 million records, uh, 41 second execution time, just pure select, select everything from this table. Now uh, we are selecting 
so by doing simple postgres transformations with no exceptions so we can do it first but number to numeric first but expiration day to day execution time is two minutes and if we call the user defined function text to integer in text to date the execution time is nine minutes so that's how much difference it makes so again that is something to be aware sometimes it's not important sometimes it's important just uh these are these numbers i think are very illustrative on what uh, might happen when the whole functions in the select list because otherwise nothing changes we do not join this table with anything so the select execution plan will be the same in all of these three cases but the execution time will be very different so uh, now after all this, so I already told like how horrible it can be, is there any way function can improve performance? Actually they can, and we just need to use them differently. Okay, uh, and uh, that's what we are going to show. Because again, I'm keeping reiterating on this because uh, in programming languages, you often uh, use uh, functions uh, just to uh, like code, um, like, you know, separating, uh, encapsulating the pieces of code which you need to reuse and it's not always a good idea with database functions okay uh, so we can use functions but we need to utilize slightly different approach no uh, code even if we do code factoring it will be in a little bit different ways uh, so in order to show one of the good usages of uh, Postgres functions, uh, let's look at the user defined types. Uh, so uh, I I can talk about user defined types, it will be another <laughs> class, another presentation, but now I will just briefly mention it. Uh, so uh, Postgres allows to define user defined types, which can be as simple as create domain, or can create enumerator, or can create a range type, or like a, any base types. Uh, so those are all simple types. Uh, what we want to look at today are user-defined composite types. And uh, many of you guys did it okay, in your life. So we can create uh, the composite type, which will be like record type. For example, here we are creating uh, the boarding pass record, which has like boarding pass ID, booking leg, flight number, etc. first, last name, seat number. So that's how your boarding pass looks like. You know, we <laughs> created this Postgres database in the midst of pandemic, so it was a little bit nostalgic. Nobody uh, would fly. Now people kind of like start to get there. So now people start to remember again what are boarding passes, what are connections, what are flights with multiple legs. So now it's like not that foreign as a year ago. <laughs> uh, so uh, composite user defined type. Uh, so what we are going to do with this and what it has to do with functions. All right. Uh, so we can create functions which return composite types. And uh, what we have here, we have like very simple function uh, which returns all boarding passes for the specific flight. Okay, so printing all boarding passes for all passengers. Uh, so it returns set of boarding pass records, okay? And, uh, you look at the body of the function, it's very simple. It returns the query, select uh, all this information we just described. And then uh, when we execute this function, it returns uh, the whole result set. So if you look at the result of the function, it will be like the same as you would select things uh, from the tables, okay? Like no, no difference from um, SQL perspective. Uh, so why it is better? Okay, you select, uh, run select, we run functions, what's the difference why it's better? So several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, there are parameters. So we do not need to write SQL each time. We can just pass different parameters. In this case, uh, we can uh, print boarding passes for any flight. Uh, also, there may be more complicated function body. There may be more things than just select. And I won't go into depth uh, here because, and like as I said, it's like whole separate topic, how you can interpret different parameters differently. Uh, then the other important thing, uh, it will uh, create different type of dependencies. And I will tell about in a second. And uh, functions will allow you to 
execute dynamic SQL. So let's look at all these other things. Um, so functions are not dependent. So why it is important? Uh, imagine you have a system where you created multiple views, materialized views and something, and then you need to modify uh, one of the underlying table or God forbid need like to drop and create something else. Uh, so uh, Postgres would not allow you unless uh, you drop cascade all dependent objects and they may have all dependent objects and in uh, real systems like in many reporting systems but we use and materialize we use uh, modifying just one element might result in cascade dropping of like 60 like 90 i had the situation when we routinely had to recreate 95 objects when something underneath was modified uh, so um that is because uh, these objects are dependent and Postgres holds this dependence. Functions, as we said, functions kind of do not know what is inside the function. So if you reference any tables, so like if instead of uh, materialized use, for example, or something, you um, uh, use uh, like you reference the tables, you reference other functions, uh, they do not know whether you did something or not. So for this function, so what we're um, doing here, we're issuing a booking, uh, a boarding pass for a specific passenger, right? Uh, so we are actually creating this boarding pass and then uh, we are executing query, select a star from boarding pass uh, and we pass this ID. So when this function is created, uh, technically this ref, uh, the function we reference should not even exist and it would not check. And if we change something with this function, if we want to create, replace, modify, it would not cascade drop uh, this function. So again, in systems where such situations occur, it's like very convenient because like, okay, we know what we're doing, okay? and we need to know what we're doing. Uh, so uh, otherwise actually if something significant changes and uh, functions wouldn't be cascade drop, you'll find everything and you'll try to execute it. But like in many cases it's more convenient because you can recompile and modify all these components. However, the functions will create different types of dependencies and uh, that will be dependencies on the types. Uh, so uh, types that's something will hopefully talking a little bit, maybe not. Okay, um, so the other thing um, which uh, we want to talk about, functions and security. Uh, so by default, um, so, okay, all objects in database have permissions so people can have like uh, select and sort of they delete uh, and other, some other permissions on the objects. So functions, if you do not do anything, uh, they do not have uh, any extra security permissions on their own. By default, uh, functions permissions are public, which means that, uh, okay, anybody can execute any function, uh, providing they have usage on the scheme of a function is created. And uh, the only way how permissions will be checked is uh, when, okay, so I'm a user. So if I have, all the permissions on the underlying objects which are inside function. So if I am granted this select, this insert, this update, then I can execute it. And if I do not have it, then I cannot execute. So uh, the security on the function by default, this executed definer, um, will be uh, that literally what permissions this user has. So the situation you often want to address you know, everybody have uh, very important business users in the organization, right? And it's very important business users always tell that we need to see production data because otherwise we cannot make our important business decisions. Uh, and um, you have kind of like two options, either to give them access to the database, which, uh, you know, you might not always be confident that important business user has all the capabilities to run SQL, which won't bring the database down. I think many of us had these experiences when very powerful business users brings the system down. This I had multiple times. Um, so uh, that's what we can do. Uh, 
So we are creating function which is a uh, security definer. So what it means? A user to whom we will grant permission to execute this function when they start execution, while they are like in the function body, they will have the same permission as the user who created this function. And then say, okay, so we are like our user, like we are DBA user in our database. So we create this function, critical function, and uh, we do whatever we need. We know we're doing it in the right way and nothing crazy, nobody is going to drop database or like delete important information. Then we will revoke execution on this function from public. That means uh, that nobody except of the user whom we designate will be able to execute this function. And then we grant execute on this function to our very important business user. So this way they actually can execute something critical on production data, but they won't be able to do whatever they want on production data. Only what we allow them and uh, basically in the way how how exactly we uh, like allow them to do this. So that is um, actually a very powerful <laughs> way of doing this. And uh, that is something which uh, we strongly recommend to you. Okay, uh, next, a function with word return. So again, for the longest time, uh, Postgres did not have procedures. Postgres only had functions. And uh, functions technically were supposed to be like used in select statements. Uh, and in many cases, we still wanted to package some set of operations uh, inside uh, like some procedural model. Uh, and for this, we uh, used functions with void return. So function which returns nothing. Uh, for example, here we are doing like function cancel flight. It will do lots of things. It will change the scheduler. It will annul all the boarding passes, etc. But it does not return anything. It's like cancel flight. Okay, done. Uh, so this function will return nothing. Uh, and um, the other, uh, like the other way, what we are doing here, we can execute it when we execute functions inside other functions. We also do not necessarily need to uh, process the return of the function. So one way is doing void function. The other way is uh, perform a uh, perform operator. So we can do perform operator inside others, and then uh, we just would not capture the return result. So that's like other way of doing this. So that was all uh, with functions. And uh, then uh, finally, you know, all the like 10 years, whatever later, more, uh, Postgres introduced procedures. So uh, now, as again with Postgres, we, with uh, same with Oracle, with Sybase, with uh, Microsoft SQL Server, now Postgres also has procedures. Uh, so what's the difference? Uh, okay, uh, actually, lots of things are the same, but many things are different. That's a good part. Uh, so to create procedure, we use create procedure, and it's same as a function. We have procedure name, procedure parameters. Only it does not need return type because procedure does not return anything. Uh, you can define the output parameters, but again, that will be parameters. Procedure does not return anything, and uh, you do not do select from procedure, you call procedure. So uh, you can, for example, execute your call cancel flight. So we do not need to create function that would return. You, need, you can just create procedure uh cancel flight uh but that's not uh kind of the best part because okay we can use void what's what's the difference so most important thing is uh transaction management finally you know i can tell you person who came uh to postgres from oracle that was like my huge disappointment uh like ah where are my transactions how i can like manage transactions how i can do like rollbacks how i can commit intermediate results it's not quite a next uh, version, next version. So I remember like for 
seven years, like after each post this conference, I was coming to one of the major contributors and ask like, so when we are going to have that? <laughs> so then finally, uh, yeah, we got them. Uh, so in storage procedures, you actually can do conditional commits. And uh, like one of the good parts is uh, here, for example, uh, when you do massive updates or massive inserts, you can commit intermediate results because otherwise you have this like huge uh, process uh, which runs forever and takes all the temp, uh, like uh, all the buffers and the everything. And uh, when it fails, then everything fails. So at least you can uh, commit stuff in the middle. That's a good part. And many other reasons why committing partially inside the function is a great thing. And uh, the other thing which functions allow uh, is the exception processing, uh, like multiple exception processing. So again, um, here uh, what we have, we have uh, several execution blocks within Stored procedure. So we can have multiple begins, multiple ends. And for each of these blocks, we can define exception. And uh, like, for example, how I use it with great success when we like literally have like lots and lots of things in one procedure. And uh, when we raise exception, at least we know in which part of the procedure this exception was raised, because otherwise you can go on and on and like, oh my gosh, when did it happen? So this way uh, that allows you to identify directly and precisely, even when the exception is the same, where exactly it happens. So uh, again, very, very, very useful tool. I think that uh, again, procedures are also kind of underused just because they are new and for many years, people actually used to use uh, void functions instead of procedures. So uh, for me, that was also like kind of a change of mindset. Okay, do you need to return something? If you don't need to return something, just create procedure, don't create function because that was also like force of habit. So uh, I'm like encouraging people using uh, sort of procedures when they do not need to return results. All right, and now we are up to the most fun part. And again, I could potentially talk about this forever, but I am not uh, because uh, like uh, it, will be, it will be separate topic. I will just outline a little bit um, about the usage of dynamic SQL. So it is probably the main purpose of using function storage procedures to be able to execute SQL dynamically. So what is dynamic SQL? For example, like this. So we have a uh, text. So V SQL is text. And uh, what we're doing, we are building the select statement here. So we assign this text variable, the text of the SQL statement, select count from booking, where booking reference, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then we execute the SQL and uh, we return the result of this execution. So that is as easy as this, uh, but uh, like why it is uh, so important because uh, you can actually generate different SQL uh, within the same function of storage procedure and execute something different depending, for example, on input parameters. Now, why it works better in Postgres? Why it works better than parameters? So that's uh, actually a mental block um, for many people who come from different uh, database systems. And I uh, often had to work with people who come, for example, from SQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server and uh, from Oracle. And all database textbooks tell you, do not use dynamic SQL, always uh, store parameterized statements because they optimize better. So that is works like kind of opposite with Postgres, okay? So why it works opposite in Postgres? Because uh, the execution plans, again, there are some exceptions to all of these statements, but like by default, most of the time, execution plans are not cached even for prepared statements. 
So that means uh, like, you know, in Oracle you execute it, it's like sits there in the uh, shared memory and each time the same query is uh, running, it's like, here is the plan, execute. So it's not the case in Postgres. Uh, optimization always happens right before execution, okay? And it happens like uh, later than all the uh, in all other systems. So in Postgres, again, except for few exceptions, the optimization is done for this particular SQL statement with this particular value. So for example, you know, um, whether uh, this particular set of parameters will produce massive result or small result or which of the uh, parameters or which of the conditions will be the most uh, restrictive condition. Kind of Postgres does not know in advance, it would optimize for this particular values. So because of that, uh, like using a dynamic SQL, it's just better and more reliable, especially actually for OTP systems, because then uh, the way better chances that each and single query will be executed the right way this very moment. Okay. Uh, so as I said, for OLTP, I'm almost not touching it because it's a huge separate topic. But I want to show you something which uh, actually uh, like kind of you know less frequently <laughs> happened probably, and I find it very useful technique. So dynamic queries for a lab, because uh, with a lab, so the problem I see with a lab systems, people often say, we do not need to optimize anything because those are reporting queries, like whenever they will finish whatever. And uh, that's what I mentioned, uh, you know, in September when I had a presentation about long queries and out of full scan. Long queries, still, we still want to optimize long queries. Uh, and uh, that's one of the examples of kind of like a little bit counterintuitive optimization of long queries. And that's like modeled from very real situation, which I had with um, like working with the marketing analytics. So that's a function, very like, okay, normal function. So what we are returning, uh, we are returning a category. So the input parameter is integer age, and we're saying, okay, so age under two is infant, uh, so from two to 12 as a child, from 12 to uh, 65 as an adult and L senior. So like function, which you can easily imagine uh, is needed uh, for the, uh, like our airlines uh, database. Uh, and again, it is uh, absolutely fine uh, when we are doing it uh, like for one, Record for a couple of records. Now, remember, we created this like huge tables. They're like specifically for the purpose. Okay, model how it will work with long analytical tweets. So, um, we have lots of passages, okay? uh, like several million passages. Uh, so, uh, if we uh, and uh, we have here a limit. Uh, again, this example is taken from the book. We had limit like literally so that it won't run forever. So we were just, you know, kind of making it more safe. Uh, so we select for each passenger uh, age category uh, and the execution time when we call this function is uh, 25 seconds. And uh, if we, instead of calling this function, like inside the select, we are doing this case statement, then the execution time was nine seconds. So like almost three times faster when we do not call this function. The function does not even do any select, you know, it's like ridiculous, right? This function doesn't perform any select, it performs data transformation, but it's still counted. Uh, so kind of our first advice was like, do not call your function, do not categorize your things while you are selecting, just do this. But then like, okay, so, we actually want to have something like categories as functions because we use it not just in this query, we use it in like 20 or 50 or 100 other queries. So how we can still do this and uh, like uh, how we can still make it reusable. Okay, here how you can make it reusable. Uh, so we can use dynamic function and look what we're doing here. So this dynamic function generates a part of SQL statement. It does not calculate anything. So the function uh, 
again, takes the age uh, as a like a parameter because it will be some column in the table and it generates the part of SQL. So it returns a string. So remember how, uh, okay, the board was doing a yellow tag body, okay, and the body and returns part of code, not the value. And what we're doing then? Anywhere when we need to use this age category, that's what we're doing. So we are selecting passenger ID, then we concatenate. So here is the dynamic query. So we execute query passenger ID, include this part with case dynamic category as age category, and uh, then we execute the statement. So we use function to generate a part of SQL. And this actually, uh, again, we uh, faced it in like more serious environment where we were able to improve uh, performance of statements like approximately four times, but that was like, you know, from an hour to 15 minutes. So it was actually a huge help. So uh, that is like one of the examples, okay? So uh, again, uh, that's uh, like, again, it is more pronounced uh, when, uh, when we have large data sets and we need to use almost the same thing. Again, uh, as everything else, it's not the universal solution. Uh, and in some cases, people still might want to opt doing something else, but it's one of the things I just wanted to illustrate how it works in uh, pretty much like an uh, unexpected way. Uh, and uh, there's still way more things to talk about functions and uh, about user-defined types and uh, how to build dynamic functions with block miracles, but you know, maybe it will be you know, topic of other talk. And this concludes this presentation. And uh, thank you so much for your participation and uh, any questions? Yes. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Hetty. Um, yes, we have two questions that have come in. Um, the first is, you mentioned that functions can't have explain. What about stored procedures? Can we see an execution plan? No, no, same story, yeah. Uh, we, we cannot get inside them. Easy. Um, and the second question is a bit long. So um, if you mm -hmm. want to pull up chat so that you can see it as well, I'll still read oh, it. Let me see. Let me see. Um, related. Uh -huh. Oh, gosh. Okay. Related to explain, you mentioned uh -huh. that the only real way to deal with this is uh -huh. to explain the statement that is inside the function. But sometimes uh -huh. that's extremely difficult. Uh -huh if the statement is dependent on the variables, values, results from previous yes. from the function. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Support. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, no, there is, again, there is no universal solution. So I can tell you some techniques which I use with functions. It's like uh, debugging functions is not fun. And that's, that's why sometimes I'm saying, you know what, if it's not super critical, just do not use, but, uh, if you actually debug the function with dynamic SQL, the results are beautiful, reliable, and uh, it's really like, I think the only way to ensure robust performance of the application. But um, the, uh, what I use, so first of all, um, like, uh, uh, you know, if you use a PG tab, uh, like, uh, you know, unit test, uh, no, sorry, uh, yeah, PG tab test, uh, you can actually build uh, so yes, uh, and sometimes you actually need to test just parts of the function. Uh, again, I can uh, talk a lot about this like testing technique. Uh, uh, yeah, most of the time you you might need to put intermediate like printouts, like raise notice. And uh, yeah, there is like no, no way unfortunately to compile. So you, you need to test separate parts. That's what I was doing. I was like passing uh, like um, pass parameter, Capture generated SQL, and then we need to take generated SQL and execute it. Uh, and then uh, most of the time, you are able to figure out what exactly is running slow, for example, what what exactly does not work. But you know what? I might uh, okay. Maybe we should have another like presentation about how to test it. <laughs> I, I never had it formalized. I mean, I have several like tricks how to do this, but uh, yeah, it's uh, like I don't have universal solution. Yeah, sorry. 
Wonderful. Okay, those seem to be our two questions. All right. Um, so with that, Hetty, thank you as always. We always love having you on um, and at, at the conference in person and online um, for these webinars. Um, and I wanna thank all of our attendees for spending a little bit of their day with us. Um, so with that, have a great rest of your afternoon and I hope to see you on future Postgres conference webinars. Thank you.